Nigeria People's Party. That was a short profile of the two candidates representing the NNPP party. Um, Dr. Konkoso, thank you so much for saying yes. I'm confused, actually. I know whether to call you Dr. Konkoso or Senator Konkoso or His Excellency, former Governor Konkoso. Um, I see that uh, the bishop couldn't make it. I understand he's unavoidably absent. But thank you for making the time. Now, before we begin, just a few things to note. Um, in addition to people in the room who will be asking questions, of uh, the senator, we have six remote locations across six geopolitical zones. And over the next course of the next two hours, we will hear from all of them. We've also collated questions sent to us via email and our social media platforms. And we'll try and get answers to as many of them as possible from our candidates. It is very important that people asking questions state their names clearly and be mindful of time to ensure that we get as many people as possible to be part of this conversation. Thank you again for saying yes to our um, invitation. So let me basically start by saying that you've tried twice before to you know, be on the ballot paper to call a contest for the presidency. They say third time lucky, you are now on the ballot paper. So when elections take place in February, Nigerians will have the option of voting for you as president. Why should we vote for you as president? Maria, thank you very much. Um, let me start by thanking Almighty God for making it possible for us to be here. And also thank Nigerians for supporting us over the years. As you rightly pointed out, I was a civil servant in Kano for 17 years. And I left service in 1991 to join politics. And in 1992, I was elected not only a member of the House of Reps, but also elected as Deputy Speaker of the House of Reps who are in the SDP and the NRC days. And I was also in the Consumer Conference of 1994-95, where we drafted the 1999 vision. And by 1999, I was governor of Kano State under the PDP. And in 2003 to 2007, I was Minister of Defense, and of course, advisor to President Wandafur and Somalia. From there, in 2007, I was nominated or appointed the representative of the Northwest on the NDDC, where I found the place very uncomfortable for my humble self to be. Therefore, I decided to resign because I couldn't sit on a board with the sort of things that were happening there. Mm -hmm. In 2011, I became governor again, 2015. In 2015, 2019, I was uh, elected at the senator representing the Kano Central. And along the line in 2015, you rightly pointed out, I contested with uh, uh, the present president, uh, Muhammad Buhari, and I was lucky to become a second here in Lagos. So also I contested in 2019 in Patakot, together with uh, others, and of course, uh, Atiku Abuakar won the primary election there. Now, from then to now, we have been working very hard to ensure that Nigerians are given the opportunity to choose, not only from the two parties, that over the years dominated the political space in this country. But we decided to bring something new. And let me say at this point that in 1998-99, when we were forming this party, our key goal at that time was the issue of kicking the military out. Mm. 
mm. which we successfully did. And it was then that we decided, I mean, we saw so many differences within ourselves, people who were at the extreme left, extreme right, and everybody in between were all in one political party. Mm. And we found it uh, very difficult to prohibit. That was why in 2013 14, we thought of bringing a progressive party, a party than PDP. Which ended up being the APC. Um, that was when we formed the APC. And uh, I was founding father of the APC. Of course, I was a governor that particular time. We only joined the party when we felt it was the time to do that. And um, under the APC, and I had also the experience of the two parties. But but I, have to, and I, have, I have to interrupt because in, in making your statement earlier, you kind of presented yourself today as providing an alternative to the APC, which is the ruling party, and the PDP. But in reality, people will just say, this is old wine in a new bottle. Because technically, you were both, you were part and parcel of both the APC and the PDP in very substantial ways. So for Nigerians watching and listening to you, there's still people who are not going to be convinced that what you're offering is actually new or fresh or different. You see, like I told you, when we started the PDP, we had this issue of bringing everybody on board. To the extent that when I was governor, and even when I was minister under the PDP, we had so many issues to so many people in that party, and it was purely ideological differences. It has nothing to do with personal issues. And that was why in 2003, I had to lose election. But those who are together with me in that party could not believe, could not agree with what we are doing. So perhaps to this them, is the time you can tell us what your underlying philosophy and ideology is now as you prepare to elect and um, to contest for office. So if, if you are elected into office, what is the under... ...elected? You see, our ideology has always been consistent, either in PDP or in APC, and even now. Ours is to see how we can make Nigeria a better place for everybody. While others, based on my personal experience, believe that uh, there are some selected ones that must be catered for. And that's where the main issue really works. When I was in Kano, when we were talking of water supply for the people on the other side, we are believing that that much water supply should be given and do their boreholes okay. and supply their families with water. Okay. When and we are doing uh, electricity yeah. or roads or health or agriculture, it's the same sort of thinking. And that is why mm. this country, we find it very, very difficult to move I will allow you to get into more details after this short break. Don't go away. Daria Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates. A presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates. 
From the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022, this very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Welcome back. You are watching the Candidates, a town hall series brought to you by Daria Media with the support of the MacArthur Foundation. And we are in conversation with the presidential candidate of the NNPP, Dr. Rabiu Musa Konkoso. Before the break, sir, you were talking to us about your underlying philosophy, which you say is people-centric and traditionally has always been people-centric. So if I can bring you to where Nigeria is today, starting perhaps with the economy. Um, how, in practical terms, will your people focus translate in terms of what you are going to do to essentially deal with the major economic issues facing Nigeria today if you are elected as president? Yes. You see, if you look at the issue of economy from the practical point of view, there are two issues. Issue one is how to make money available into the treasury. Today, unfortunately, because of some obvious reasons, government at the center is finding it extremely difficult to get the maximum resources that should be in the treasury. Our main source of income in this country is oil, and today we are told that the 2.2 million barrels of oil allocated to Nigeria by OPEC cannot be achieved. In fact, uh, the figures that we have is below 1 million barrels per day. About a million. Let's say 1 million, yeah. which is less than 50% of what we should get. Right from there, you could see huge problem. Of course, that can be said about other areas where government is supposed to raise the maximum it can get into the treasury. So if you, what now, will you do to solve the yes, problems I'm that coming. mean, yeah, because yeah, the theft... still on the economy, before yeah. I go to what uh, I should do, is the issue of spending the money itself. Right. No. Government must keep its eyes on what goes out of the treasury. And the issue of corruption, and of course, other wastages that we see right from the presidency down to the civil servants, and of course, the contractors or contracts and so on and so forth must be checked and eyes must be on every naira that government is spending. In other words, we believe that there is a lot of wastage today in this country. And these are the two areas, what goes in and what goes out. And what we are going to do from the uh, aspect of what goes into the uh, treasury is to ensure that there is enough security in this country for all our assets to ensure that nobody takes anything out of this country. And that's why we thought of providing adequate security in terms of manpower, in terms of equipment, IT, and intelligence, and everything so that is necessary to save our assets in this country so that we can have the maximum. But you, I'm sure you, you, you accept, Senator Konkoso, that we're not hearing anything from you that we don't hear from other candidates, saying that they are going to... They, they, everybody says these are the problems, and then the real problem is explaining to Nigerians how. What are you saying that is different from the 18 other candidates that are contesting for this office? 
in terms of, for example, if we take some of the issues you've talked about, let's take them one by one. You talked about the fact that our income um, from our main uh, export um, commodity oil is down. It's down as a result of theft, it's down as a result of um, wastages, it's, it's, there's a whole myriad of reasons why it's down. So how will you solve that first problem of revenue? And is that the only revenue you'll be looking at? If you are going to diversify, what are you diversifying into? How are you diversifying? From which time to which time should we expect to see a difference in you know, um, the revenue of the federal government? So that's one, and then we can talk about security. Now, you see, I'm not sure, Kadria, if you know or saw our blueprint. We are completely different from others because we mentioned the issues, the problems in this country, and we came very clearly to tell Nigerians how we are going to bring solution to those problems. For example, on the issue of security, and as former Minister of Defense and former governor for eight years in Kano State, and former member of the NDDC advisor to President Van Darfur and Somalia crisis, and so on and so forth. We came very clearly, we looked at the number of the military members of the armed forces that we have today. And it was very clear to us that the number is too small under our circumstance, under the number of people that we have today in this country, and of course the challenges. Mm. And that was why after making consultations with other experts, we felt that there was need to increase the number to less than 250 that we have today mm. to about 1 million because we looked at the recommended uh, figure or ratio in terms of that, that's numbers a 70 of percent forces. increase you're talking about sorry a 70 percent increase in personnel for for our defense and our yes about security. about that about that over 60 percent have you done increase. the numbers of how much yes let me this finish will okay. we'll come to all those uh, things so i hope uh, you will uh, look at our blueprint and I get have, the details actually. If you have, okay, fine and good, and I'm happy, you, maybe you read it. And we will have some to give you and give to some other people to look at it. And so also the police. We feel the number of police today is much less than they should be. And that was why uh, from left... And that was why... Uh, from less than 230, we thought of making it to about a million also. And of course, we have other areas that we feel that there is need for us to increase the number to ensure that within the shortest possible time, every square meter in this country is being taken over for Nigerians. Okay. Uh, uh, unlike the situation today, where many people in many towns and villages have to be paying uh, to bandits and other criminals even to go, out, to, go to their farms. Okay. You know, this is not an interview, it's a town hall. I have a lot of people on standby, they want to ask questions. Sure. We will get an opportunity perhaps to talk about the cost of some of your plans, but for now I want to go straight to Enugu, who are on standby, so that they can ask the distinguished senator their questions. Enugu, good evening. Good evening from the coal city, Enugu. I am a former Ajumumi. And questions are quite ready from the students. They've been listening attentively and they have something to ask the candidate. We've got two students on standby. We would have Valentine and Chisum. Valentine, let's hear you. Valentine Obelago from the Department of Microbiology. My question for you today is. According to premium times, Nigeria needs 365,000 doctors to fully manage and maintain the health sector, but we only have 24,000 available. If elected, how do you plan to manage the mass exodus of professionals? And what reforms do you put in place for all sectors? Thank you. 
Valentine is concerned about the health sector. What will our candidate do to, you know, reform the health systems? We also have Chisum on standby. Good evening. My name is Izzy Chisum. So Chisum Izzy from the Department of International Relations. My question is, if you believe in restructuring or do you believe the current political structure of Nigeria is okay? If yes, why? If no, what do you plan on doing about it? Thank, Thank you. you. That's the match we have from Enugu State, Nigeria. Thank you very much for that, those two questions. Enugu, um, how will you, you know, deal with the mass exodus of professionals like doctors that we're seeing? And do you believe in restructuring? If you do, what does restructuring mean to you? Thank you very much. Now, on the issue of health sector in this country, like all other sectors, actually, we have, been, we have not been getting it right. And that was why, for example, in Kano, we decided that we should not only produce doctors and other professionals in health sector for the state, but we thought that we had an opportunity to produce these professionals not only for the North or Nigeria, but to produce even for international markets. And that was why uh, in the four years that I was governor at Ward in the second term from 2011, 2015, we decided to sponsor our students in almost all the institutions you can remember in this country and, of course, abroad. That was why, in four years, we were able to sponsor over 3,000 young men and women of Kano State uh, uh, people. When I say people, I mean residents not indigenous, over 3,000 in four years. Among them, we have many uh, people who are sponsored to go and study in various fields. I remember we had one set of 300 medical doctors going abroad at that time, and uh, only 45 were men. All the others among the 300 were female. And we did that uh, specifically to have people who are very much likely to stay in Kano and work for the state, even when they didn't sign any bond to stay when they come back. I want you to respond. Also, yeah, before you go further, I want you to respond to, to, to something specifically because I'm one of the, your most touted achievements, even among people who support you, is the um, scholarships that you're talking about. And he, um, the sitting governor of um, Kano State, uh, His Excellency Ganduje, claims that um, actually your much touted scholarship programs were a fraud. He's quoted in the Daily Trust as saying that you used contractors to gain admi admissions for people and administer scholarship, turning, and I quote, the whole admission exercise into a racket. He was reported as saying this according to the Daily Post. In 2006, the Kano State Acting Governor, Professor Hafiz Abubakar, alleged that about $28 million and over $6 billion was inherited by the Ganduji administration as debt in respect of foreign and local scholarships that you gave out. So I think you should respond to these two things, and then we can... Well, I thought on. I would finish with the uh, question. Okay, so we just that they are related. Yes, no problem. You see, ordinarily, I don't want to talk about uh, Kano State Government. Right. For me, I have passed that level many, many years ago. I was governor in 1999, and uh, whoever is governor in Kano today can be seen to be very much my junior in the game. But in any case, don't forget... Deputy it's not governor, about him, it's about Nigerians. Just a second, please. Ganduji was my deputy governor from 1999 to 2003. He was my deputy governor in 2011 to 2015. 
And of course, he was my SE in Ministry of Defense when I was there. And um, I don't mind whatever I will say, but the fact of the matter is that Rabi Konkoso never borrowed one naira from any bank, from any individual, from anybody, either in this country or abroad. So I am one governor who has never borrowed. And in fact, I had anything borrowed. Not only that, in 1999, when I was elected as governor, I inherited a lot of debt, which I paid in four years. I lost the election in 2003. Eight years after, I came back and inherited another debt. In four years, I paid. I left Kano without borrowing one naira. So, so now, this, just this one wasn't second. about Can debt, let me specifically. Tell you. It was this about is... the scholarship. So maybe no, I didn't ask many the question. I was asking. Okay. I have to answer one at a time. Okay, sir. If you are talking of scholarship, in fact, I paid to the last Kobo up to the time I was living. In fact, our policy then was to pay scholarship um, not only up to the, uh, that particular time, but to pay in, even in advance. But what we did was to even send our representatives across the world to find out how much we were to pay. But the point was that uh, there were courses that were not completed at that particular time, which is natural. Even you and me who would want to send your style to local university or international university or out of the country, you pay per session. And we paid after that. No university was owing. I mean, we are not owing any university, when any one naira. Okay. Forget about whatever So these are opponent, just allegations. The opponent can say anything. Enemy can say anything. So it does not matter. But okay. uh, what I say, if anybody has got any proof to prove otherwise, that will be fine and good. But okay. the fact of the matter is we have not borrowed anybody uh, and uh, if there is any debt, anybody is paying. Kano state government, which of course we are not in the same party, they should direct the person to me. As a person, I'll be happy to pay them. So let's go back to the students who asked you questions. If you could conclude on the issue around how you sort out mass exodus and also the restructuring of Nigeria. Yes. Those were the two other questions. Okay. Now you see our master plan in Kano and by extension in this country, is to produce all these professions. And it's possible. And it's doable. We have the resources. I always tell Nigerians now, as I was... I always tell Nigerians now, as I was telling the people of Kano, that in this country we have enough resources to take care of if only you have good leadership at those levels. We have proved it in Kano, and that is our plan. Even though at the national level we have issues now, we are told that uh, um, what, we, what we are getting today is not even enough to service the debt which is a special circumstance, mm -hmm. and I believe we will come to that. But the point is that uh, not only in the area of health, not in the area of infrastructure and so on, I believe we have the capacity to produce enough manpower for our needs in this country, and of course, even for export. But initially, we will encourage our young men and women in diaspora to come back we will create a conducive atmosphere. I was in the so UK. That's sort of the short-term plan. I was in the UK myself back. for about right. 10 years. Uh -huh. I know nobody outside this country, a Nigerian, for that, who is living anywhere in this world, will claim to be his comfortable. I was not comfortable when I was there. The weather is enough to worry you. I have so many other things. Even the money, I can tell you, the money that they claim to be paying or receiving, they give you right hand, they take by left in terms of taxes and so on. We have many friends, many brothers and sisters abroad who have been there for many decades, but many of them have very little to show. 
So I believe that uh, we are interested as government for them to come back. We will also give them a conducive atmosphere. And that is what it's like in today. In fact, our system, even in the what area of health... What does a conducive atmosphere look yes, like and how will you do it? Tell you, let us start from producing the professional themselves. What we have today in all the areas, mm -hmm. if you look at health, for example, you graduate from a university in Nigeria or elsewhere, you come back even to go for housemanship. Huge problem. Slots are allocated. In, when I was governor, I was made to understand that the maximum any nursing school can, can, can be allocated by the nursing council was 100. Mm. For that reason, I had to build more than two universities, I mean, two institutes. That's uh, nursing schools who built two. Uh, so also we built two um, midwifery and, of course, one uh, health technology. Okay. Now, the point is that uh, some of those bottlenecks must be addressed. I have gone to universities abroad where we have hundreds of doctors. I will impart maybe a thousand. But I am sure, I don't know of today, all these universities, even maybe a university like Bayero University, they will allocate 100 to them. Okay, why 100? Why not 200? Why not 300? Okay, what are the facilities? What do you need for us to produce 1,000 doctors in Canada? And I think you so are now... now that's the issue of production. Yes. Now, the issue... You see, we live in a small world today. Yes. If you are not too competitive, you cannot tie anybody's leg to say you have to stay here. Now, what we do, like you said, we look at the issues that are making them to get out of this country while we are producing as many as possible. Now, once we sort out the problems, I can tell you from my practical experience, most of them will come back home. There is no place like home. We okay. all know that. And, and, and I think um, when you finish answering the question on restructuring, we will come back to this because there are one or two solutions you've suggested, including in the area of um, dealing with insecurity, that require a degree of spending. And I want us to dive a little bit deeper into where you will think you will find the money, given the difficulty the country is in. But the, the question on restructuring, I think, is an important one. Yes. Do you believe in restructuring? If you do, what does restructuring you actually see, mean to you? I believe in restructuring. I believe in ensuring that we go through so many reforms, so many changes, the system not working today, and this system must work not only for few, it must work for most Nigerians, if not all the Nigerians. You see, the issue of restructuring, whatever that means, because it you, you, what does it mean to you? different what to so it? many people. Yeah, you, you see, look, I will tell you, when I was in the consular conference, there were so many people who were hell bent on changing from the presidential system of government to parliamentary system of government. And that was a very fundamental structure at that particular time. But of course, there were a few. And therefore, we opted and recommended that we should continue with the presidential system of government. Now, in recent days, in recent years, so many people were talking about additional states. People were talking of additional local governments. Some even felt local governments uh, are, the, are constituted today. They are not needed. You know, so many opinions and even issues of state police and so on. They all fall in the part of uh, uh, restructuring at the seed. But let me tell you, in my own opinion, you see, we have system failure. Now, this failure translates into people looking around 
to pinpoint why we found ourselves where we are today. Mm -hmm. To the extent that people are making many suggestions, including, the, for example, in the security, we have big issue in the security, everybody knows in this country. So people are saying, okay, the best way is to have state policy. Now, if we had peace, I mean, nobody will start thinking of alternative. But no, what you are saying mm. as NMPP is that we are going to provide adequate security for each and every Nigerian. Because we believe without security, you cannot do anything. The economy will continue to collapse. So no state the, police for NNPP. That's what we are saying. And we say we are open. You see, security, even Mr. President, cannot go into this bedroom and come out tomorrow and announce that uh, because he believes in having state police, that we are going to have state police today or tomorrow. Okay. It has to follow due process. Okay. What we are saying in NNPP, if it is the wish of Nigeria to have state police, so be it. How will you know? Are you intending to call some sort of conference? What, I mean, how you now, know I will tell you what I what? intend to do first. Okay. Okay. I have my own ideas. So that's the idea, collective idea of the NNPP is that the number of the police in this country, we are going to increase it. We are going to dominate every square meter in this country. We have to bring peace. Now, if we have peace all over the country, and if some people are still saying they still want police, uh, state police or local government police or whatever police, then we look at it. But our agenda captured the issue of state police in the area of restructuring. We are not against it. But as I told you, because of the failure in terms of security today, everybody, every professional is bringing one suggestion or the other to sort out the issue of security. And you know, you can't blame anybody. The way things are going, mm. unfortunately, I mean, people, you have to talk about it, especially in northern part of the country, uh, especially in the area of Kaduna, Bulungwari area, in Zampara, in Kebbi, in Sokoto, of course in uh, Asina, even in Kano, in yeah. many other places. So all these things must be put on the table. We are politicians, we are Democrats, we are going to listen to the people. What they say, we listen to them. Okay. Those who are... Let me, you saw me carrying my phone. I'm not very good with numbers. So I was doing some little calculation. The current personnel cost of the Nigerian police <coughs> is about 712 billion. If we increase police to about a million policemen, which is sort of part of your proposal, police to about a million policemen, which is sort of part of your proposal. You're looking at a salary structure of about two trillion per annum. And so it brings me back to the conversation I've been wanting to have. First of all, you're inheriting a budget that has a huge deficit. You're going to inherit a lot of debt. Um, the external reserves that are not at all time low. And I'm looking around, we're not necessarily like we agreed productive. We are import-based, so everything that we consume, we actually have to find, not Naira, somebody else's currency, and bring it in. And so from the one, we are confronted with essentially issues around financing. And few of your plans, I've listened very carefully, entail a degree of spending. How are you going to deal with that conundrum? Now, you see, while you are doing that arithmetic, Yes. I want you also to do this arithmetic in terms of oil that we are using on daily basis. From 2.2 million barrels per day, now, according to you, is about 1 million. So 1.2 million barrels a day times uh, 365, or if you like, monthly times 30, uh, and so on and so forth times the dollars. But that's as you mean from the one you are going to... No, you see the to... one I will tell you. You see our creditors are, I believe, sensible. He 
you sit down together with them, discuss this issue, sit on the table. You have to survive. The country has to move forward. Because we are all in, it does not mean that we have to die that day. We will sit down, negotiate with our own critics, and explain to them, tell them, and you can, I can assure you, uh, even before you tell them, uh, once they know it's a responsible government, they will listen. So we have to reschedule many things. We have to sit down and agree on many things. They want to get their money. Yes, we'll pay, but the fact of the matter is we have to be alive before we pay them. Mm. So we will sit down and negotiate the debt, uh, reschedule, agree on whatever is necessary, and then we move forward. And these monies, you see, from my own experience in the Tano State, I told you I never borrowed. Mm. And I believe that the resources the federal government is having with good management of resources, it is going to be good enough for each and every one of us in this okay. country. I'm going to open up the conversation. I think I've uh, dominated uh, asking of the questions for too long. So, a studio audience, anybody with questions, raise your hand, we'll get the mic, please say your name, keep the question short, and we'll take about three, come back to him so that they're not too much. When he has answered, we'll then go back and do another three. Okay, sir, please go ahead. Your Excellency, good evening. My name is Al Mukhtar Adamu. My question is uh, on economy, Your Excellency, sir. That is our Naira uh, two currency system that we have now Naira dollar system in Nigeria, where the CBN introduces flexible exchange rate. That is, the, the PTA, DTA rate is different with the DDC rate and it's also different with the from M rate where they are sending it abroad. The Excellency, the, S, the flexible exchange rate of which stand as this week of 420 naira per dollar and the black market about 780 as at yesterday, Friday. How will you balance between the official <coughs> and black market rate? Which uh, the, margin, the margin according to the CBN should not be more than 3%. If the dollar is 420 Naira at the official rate, so the market rate is supposed to be uh, 423 Naira. That is 3 Naira different. But now Nigerians are buying dollars almost 800 Naira. And everything is you, you keeping... You need to ask your question, please. Okay? Yeah, the question, please. if you elected as a president, how will you tackle this flexible exchange rate Thank of the you. CVN? Okay, and, and I have to allow him to answer that because Thank I need to go much. to break after this, then we'll come back to the audience. No, you will see, you flow to the Naira? Uh, God, you, yeah. you see, this issue of dollar, there are so many things in And the government must do a lot in so many sectors and areas. I remember when I was living in this country, end of 1981, early 80, my um, traveling allowance, I still have it, is 1 to 0.85 a dollar. Point, sorry, 0.85 naira equals to 1 dollar. Now we are talking of this 780. In fact, some few weeks ago, it's even more than that. Now, a lot, we made so many mistakes, and those mistakes must be corrected if we have to get it right. Now, the issue of security, very critical. If, for example, nobody goes out to, to the farm, nobody goes there to the factory, nobody goes there to buy and sell and so on, huge problem. If you don't have electricity to produce goods and services, huge problem. If you don't have the required manpower to handle your factories, industries, and so on, another huge problem. So, so there are so issues. many things that government must do. You have to provide infrastructure, um, infrastructure as soon as you can. You have to provide security as soon as you can. You have to encourage young men and women to go to schools, 
uh, across the country. And that was why in our blueprint, we say the first thing we are going to do was to build 500,000 classrooms for about 20 million out of school children. Because I have to go to break, I need to just ask so, you, will you encourage the CBN to continue with the current policy? Now, let me tell you, you see some of these things. Mm. We, in government, for example, we know our responsibility. Central Bank, Ministry of Finance, we know their responsibility. Monetary, and so on. Uh, uh, they will handle it as their own as professionals in that area. So what I'm saying is, it's not a, a matter, I mean, we have to get away of margin this, because we have seen a situation where you sell at 420, somebody will buy from you, he or she will cross the road and sell at 780. That will not be acceptable. Mm. You have to get a way of synergy, of bringing them uh, together. And that, I can tell you, is not just by mouth. It has to be practical. You have to do all what it takes by the government, especially the issue of corruption itself. Somebody who is will, today he himself will get one billion. You go and buy dollar at all, whatever it is you will buy. Okay, so let me let me take a quick break, and when we come back, we will go to the remote sites because they are eagerly waiting to jump into this conversation and ask questions. You are watching the candidate coming to you live on the Nigeria Television Authority and other partner stations, and also the radio services of the FRC. And I am in conversation along with other Nigerians with the presidential candidate of the NNPP, um, Prof. Dr. Senator Rabi Musa. So don't go away. Barrier Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall media series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Choosing where to study is one of the biggest decisions you will make in life. So, it is important to get it right. enroll in our regular programs and obtain a degree exclusively awarded by Cole City University. Alternatively, you can enroll in our International Pathway Program, which will enable you to earn two degrees in four years from Cole City University and Delaware State University, United States. Visit www.ccu.edu.ng. Cole City University, education for self-actualization. Welcome back. You are watching The Candidates, a Daria Media Town Hall series brought to you with the support of the MacArthur Foundation and in partnership with the Nigeria Television Authority, Cable Entertainment, Zikoko Citizen, Silverbird Television, FRCN, Radio Now, Fox TV, New Central Television, NJ Media TV, Captain TV. Now let us go straight to Bayero University, Kano, where Stephen is on standby alongside other students. Hello, Kano. Hello, good evening. Welcome to Bayeru University, Kano. My name is Stephen Eok. Firstly, I want to say happy International Men's Day to all men in the world. We have Spiff, Jessica, and Mariam Hamza who are ready to ask their questions. Let's start with Spiff, Jessica. 
All right. Good evening. My name is Jessica Spieff, uh, Level 4 International Relations student, and this is my question. My question is regarding the economy, and as we all know, Nigeria is actually suffering a big blow in which about 70% of the country's income is going into the country's debt service and the remaining 30% going in back into the system. So I want to know now what are the practical solutions that the candidate is going to put in place because he said earlier that he's not one to go into borrowing. So what are the other practical solutions you are going to guarantee us as Nigerians that you're going to raise the country's GDP and as well make sure that we, the youth of the country, are going to also um, benefit from this economic Okay. Thank you. Next is Mariam Hamza. Good evening. My name is Mariam Omotola Hamza. And my question goes thus. The education sector has been neglected over time in terms of budget allocation. Only 5 to 9 percent to education. Whereas UNESCO's minimum recommendation is that 25% of the national budget be, be allocated to the education sector. As a concerned Nigerian student, I want to know how the candidate intends to fund the education sector to bring back its lost glory. Thank you. Okay, um, so... Are, are you sure they are from Kano? <laughs> I don't think so. I don't they, think they are from Kano. These are Bayer University I can students. guess from Bayer University. Yes. You see those in Kano, in my opinion, shouldn't be in a hurry to ask those. Right. Why? Yes, because ideally they should know the way we operated in. <laughs> you see... Maybe these ones are too young. It, yeah, but maybe they just want other Nigerians to... You know, yeah. you see, what we invested in Kano was more than the recommended 25%. Right. In fact, recently, I was asked a similar question when we had uh, Channel's uh, uh, town hall meeting. And I had to go and check and put all the figures together. We did over that, over 25% during my time as governor. And what we have today in our blueprint, if we have an opportunity to uh, implement them, definitely it will be more than 25% of the national budget. And that was my own uh, uh, estimation. Do you think part of the problem why perhaps they may not remember is because your legacy hasn't endured? And if it well, hasn't, maybe what I do you think is the problem? I don't want to go into that. You see, if you go into government, what you do is to ensure your success from the one up to the last day. What happens behind you, you have little or no control uh, mm -hmm. of that. Right. And I don't think anybody will hold you responsible. Now, let me say that um, the education is key to us. In fact, uh, before now, in Kano, if you ask us, our uh, priority number one is education, education three is education. But now the situation on the ground, on the aspect of security, we realize that uh, if we don't have the security, even to go to school will be very difficult. In fact, we have seen cases in many states, especially in Northeast, where so many schools were vandalized, were burnt down, so many students were picked, and so on and so forth. So security is key. Government, our government will go uh, to any length to ensure peace in the country because that's where we have good economy, good education, good this, good that uh, in the country. So um, I want them to be rest assured that uh, if they look at our record uh, in Kano, we, yeah, we are sure we have more than 25% of our budget going into education. And I believe that uh, we are going to put a lot of money in education. In fact, that was why we said that even the jump, P, Wayek, Neko, nobody, no child will be denied going to the next level of education 
because he, globally, child, she yeah, let, let me ask has you no money to pay. Yeah, globally, education is changing um, because of the nature of um, the world. You know, because we we are in a tech world, and the way people are getting educated is shifting. Not everybody now goes to a classroom, for example, to sit to pass exams. Are you in any way, shape, or form thinking about reimagining education? Or for you, what exists currently is good enough and it just has to be funded properly and has to be run properly? You see, education has to be funded. Education is key. And that was why, for example, in Kano, I'm happy they are listening to us. No child of school age was denied going to school in Kano. That was why we built thousands of classrooms. That's why we provided thousands of furniture, we provided uh, 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 offices, workshops, we built hundreds of secondary schools, we built 44 technical schools, we built schools for Islamic studies, and that was why we even had law to prohibit anybody sending his child elsewhere. If you want Islamic education, Western education, this is the school and so on and so forth. And that was why we sent our children, I told you over 3,000 in four years, to 14 countries across the world, and that was why we even selected private universities in this country. You and realize that when those, you left as governor, there were 1.5 million out of school children in Kano. You asked today. No, I'm saying when no, you left in 2015, I'm telling like, you. Just tell them, I hope whoever is listening, should come with his figures. I am telling you the figures are 1.5 million. I mean, they're worse now, but when you left, there were 1.5 million I'm saying. children. I am saying it's not true. Okay. Maybe they left Kano, maybe they were not in Kano, but I can and tell they you, came back we after prohibited. Let me tell you, I was the governor. But any, if anybody, either local or international, has got anything to the contrary, yeah, he is free. But what I'm saying to you is that during our time, we built enough classes for every child going to primary schools. We built enough uh, secondary schools, hundreds of secondary schools, including technical schools, and so on and so forth. And we provided uh, tertiary level education to everybody to the extent that the two universities I established in 2001, that is Kano And is that Kano same Kano recipe? Just a second, please. Let yes. me conclude this. And 2000 and uh, at once, that's Northwest University. We are not even having enough. We had to be making announcements and announcements for anybody with university qualification to go and get admission. As far as we are concerned in government, we can comfortably say that we did everything possible to bring Kano, not Kano indigenous, but Kano residents to go to schools. Now, if somebody was hiding somewhere, or somebody is doing his own uh, study somewhere and he came with one million, then mm -hmm. that's, that's it. In fact, let me tell you, for the eight years I was governor, we were feeding our children lunch. Okay. For let, the let four me, years let me I was governor, eight years I was governor, let me yes. conclude. Yes, sir. We were even two sets of uniform. Do you know why? It's to encourage them to come. Okay. It's not like there were too many, but we are telling them, please come to school. And then if somebody comes with this... Uh, these so, are the international numbers. Well, they could be international. Who keep, but could I, be international. I, I don't want to drag this with you. Yes. So let's, let's quickly go to Ibadan, where Nero is on standby. Hello, Nero from Lagos. Hello, Kadria. How are you doing? I'm good. Okay, Thank you. Let's, let's go straight. Uh, you're here live at the University of Ibadan. Of course, uh, we have the uh, Communications and Language Arts Department, where we have the students gathered here listening with rapt attention. And we have two questions from two uh, students right here. We'll start off with the lady, and first up is Ediomo. Ediomo, let's have your question. Good evening, sir. My name is Akpan Ediomo, student of CLA, University of Ibadan. So I have two questions for you today. As a man who's in the political position since 1992, that's 30 years, how can you say, what can you say you've done remarkably that can convince us enough to Okay, we seem to have lost her there. Um, are we working? 
And secondly, in regards to fake and hopeful Nigerians. Okay, I, I believe you heard the first question, and uh, our first choice now. Let's go straight to the uh, next person, and that's uh, talking about. Uh, Actually, Nira, uh, could you recap that question, please? Because we lost her there for a bit. Oh, okay. I do go ahead and recap your question. Okay, I said my first question is as a man who's held many political positions since 1992, that's 30 years, what can you say you've done? 30 years that is convincing enough for us to take you as a president. And secondly, in regards to your scholarship, how do you intend to broaden it in order to reach more Nigerians and help them? Okay, I believe that uh, that question, I hope it's clear at this time. And also, we have Theodore here, and Theodore will also be asking his own question. Okay, good evening, sir. Um, I have two questions. So, in, in relationship with the federal character, I know there's a provision that allows for um, leadership that spread across the geopolitical zones. And in the last 24 years, if I'm correct, we've had a um, 12-year leadership from the northern um, region. So my question in regards to that is, do you think that your ambition as a president does not defy the interests of federal character, like at least so that there will be equity in, in the tenure of leadership? Then secondly, in an interview, I don't know, I can't remember clearly whether it was on Arise or Channels TV, you made a comment that um, the Igbos are bottom feeders in democracy. So, do you not think that that statement would affect the number of votes you might get in the long run if you really would be aiming to get them at least 25% in all these states? Thank you. <coughs> thank you very much. You had the four questions. Okay, thank you very much. You see, this first question, there are too many things to say. And I don't think even the two hours are enough to <coughs> tell her or him why I feel. I am different. Fact, my started, strength, I will it? tell you, uh, my strength is the 30 years she mentioned. In fact, mean? it's my strength in the 30 years to, be in the the system, okay. to be in the system and be almost everywhere. But by the grace of God, today I am one of the credible people in this country. Very important. You think that's an achievement that you've been in the system and still credible? Not everybody can go, even many of them, one opportunity they will sold their fingers, and that's the end of it. They can't even show their faces anywhere. So these 30 years has given me opportunity to learn so many things. In fact, if I had opportunity in 2007, like my brother, late Umar er Adwa, I wouldn't have done what I believe I can do today. Because between that time and this time, I have learned so much about leadership in this country. And that was why, when I was governor 1999-2011, I left for eight years and came back second term, 2011-2015. Everybody now is remembering the second, the second term, much more than the first term. But you realize we're dealing with an electorate that is fairly young, a lot of them spread across Nigeria, and some would argue um, knowledge of you is limited in the southwest, in the south south, in the southeast. You're not as popular, many would argue, around this part as you are in the north. And so you can understand why young people who are sort of just coming up, new voters, all of that, are asking this question. And, and, and does that pose a challenge, actually, for you and your, for can your candidacy? given the fact that primarily people think of you as being very strong in the north, but fairly or new no. in the south. You see, we always tell our friends that just don't meet somebody in the airport or somewhere on the road and pass judgment on you. Go home and find out. If you go to Kano now, they will tell you who is Rabi Kokos. Yes, but people Based of Lagos can Just, go just to one Kano. second. Mm. Now, this knowledge goes with geography. This knowledge goes with many other things. And that was why the idea of having opportunity to be in so many places, to, have in, to be in contact with so many people. My friends, my colleagues who are in the NDDC, my friends and brothers who are in the National Assembly, in fact, just recently, we celebrated our 30 years since we were elected into the House of Representatives. So the point is that uh, we have the opportunity 
to go around in this country to make friends, to make contact. And that was why when we brought out this party, the NNPP, within a very short period of time, so many Nigerians joined the party, not because of the letters of the NNPP, no, because of the credibility of Rabi Konkoso, because of the credibility of the board chairman, because of the credibility of the leadership of our party from the national to the words and so on and so forth. And, and that I'm was happy why it report. went like wildfire. Okay, and and now we have the structures in all the words, in all the local governments, in all the states and zones and the national level. And it is because of those 30 years you mentioned that today our party is number one party. Uh, Even, I, 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 I will think... tell you, let me tell <laughs> okay, you. No, no, Kazia, it's not that I, the what, bishop is here, yeah, I will tell you. and I'm trying to see if we can bring him on as quickly as possible oh. so that your running mate. No, he will come. Uh, yeah, he's always uh, yeah, he's, so we will he's take, gone for an assignment. We will, we will take a short break because he's around. I want to bring him on stage. Mm -hmm. And because my directors are telling me we'll take a short break, then when we come back, you will take the other questions that were asked about your comments about the the Igbos, et cetera, et cetera. I haven't forgotten. We will give you that opportunity to respond, I promise. Um, don't go away. Join us in a minute. <coughs> You're watching The Candidate. Daria Media, in association with Cabal Entertainment, presents The Candidates, a presidential town hall meeting series where the presidential candidates of the six leading political parties tell us about their plans for the country. Join Kadaria Ahmed as she leads us into the world of these candidates from the 17th to the 23rd of November 2022. This very important program will be streamed on FRCN, Radio Now, DSTV, NTA, Facebook, YouTube, and more. This is a town hall meeting you shouldn't miss. Tune in. Let's hear from the candidates. Choosing where to study is one of the biggest decisions you will make in life. So, it is important to get it right. At Cole City University in Ugu, Nigeria, we pride ourselves on providing students a stable academic calendar and education of international standards. Cole City University give students incredible personal attention and support. You can enroll in our regular programs and obtain a degree exclusively awarded by Cole City University. Alternatively, you can enroll in our international pathway programs, which will enable you to earn two degrees in four years from Cole City University and Delaware State University, United States. Visit www. Also, the presidential candidate of the NNPP, and I'm pleased to say we have also been joined by Bishop Ida Rosa, the vice presidential candidate of the same party. Thank you, sir, for Thank finding so the much. time. I understand you've gone away on assignment and you rushed to come back to join I us. Rushed to come back, but then the delay was caused due to VIP movement. Right, um, that phrase <laughs> that we don't like hearing. Okay, we'll come to you and ask a few things in a minute, but I just I want to um, allow um, Dr. Gonkoso to respond to a few questions that were asked out of the University of Ibadan just before you joined us. So the questions around comments that were uh, made by you, quoted by the student around the Igbos, and the issue of federal character, whether you think by contesting, you're essentially guaranteeing if you win, we're going to end up with a lopsided arrangement where the North would have led for much longer than the southern part of the country. Those were the two questions. Okay, thank you very much. You see, I don't want to go into the arithmetic and uh, argument of how many presidents we have uh, from the north or from the south, but um, I know that uh, if you add, you go by that argument from 1999 to 2000, 
and uh, want it to now, we can see which uh, part of the country had more years than the other. But that's not my argument. The argument is that uh, we have a party, the NNPP, which uh, has been strengthened, populated, and of course, uh, now is very much on the ground. And party, you see, the, 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 the idea of who becomes a presidential candidate is purely a political party affair. And it goes with strategy, of course, to win the election. Many people in this country believe that uh, the situation has gone so bad to the extent that people are looking for the best. In fact, I met somebody who was telling me, and I believe that's an extreme, that if you can go and hire somebody from somewhere outside this country, <laughs> that, that is probably an extreme uh, thinking, to come and fix Nigeria, he would be very happy. So you can now see how people are thinking. So the issue now is we found ourselves in this situation. And people are looking for an answer. That's in terms of who is the best candidate. And we believe in NNPP that the candidates of our party are the best. And of course, we are talking of the candidates of the presidency and of course, vice president. We believe this combination is the best, well-balanced uh, ticket. And we are all committed to uh, 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 one Nigeria, a Nigeria that will work for each and every one of us, not minding your religion, not minding north or south, not minding your ethnicity, and so on and so forth. Now, we had an opportunity in the past. We have proved it in Kano. The scholarship the, 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 the gentleman was talking about, we have in almost all the all states today, you have people who have gone abroad. I'm not talking of local scholarship in the name of Kano. And it was deliberately new because we believe that where you are is your home. Okay. If you come from any part of the country and you are living in Kano, we believe that's your home. Okay, so let me let that, this issue of um, the fact that people really, in reality, want to come to and that a mere united Nigeria that works for role is what the NMP, NMPP stands for. Nonetheless, Bishop Idahosa, you cannot deny the fact that there is seemingly seems to be a lot of fracturing, whether deliberately um, politicians again and again have exploited our fault line, whether that is ethnicity, whether that is religion, to the extent that these things now are becoming a recurring decima every time we have election. And there are those who argue that we're very fractured. So how does the NMPP intend to unite Nigeria in real practical terms? In real practical terms, it's all about leadership. Where you find what drives the system is on the wheel of transparency, justice, equity, fairness, inclusivity, and trust is built. Once trust is built, things will begin to run their course. But you see, when we have selfish people, greedy people, who are not lovers of the country, they accumulate so much, and that's where you find the lopsidedness in nepotism, mm. where people don't observe for a character. They and they always will think they'll be there forever. They are not. The God factor is a big factor. When you fear God in leadership and able to say what you want to do and then surround yourself with people who will tell you the truth, it doesn't matter whose ass is God, then Nigeria will be a better place for everyone. Let's go to a few of our remote sites because we're running fast out of time and it's really important that we get all the six sites in. Um, can we connect to University of Meduguri, please? Hello, good evening, Nigeria. Uh, this is Musa Osman from the campus of University of Meduguri, uh, live. 
We have been following the conversation taking place between Kadria and uh, Senator Ravi Musafa Koso and his running mate that has just joined us. It has been very interesting and the students here have been following the discussions. We have a couple of questions from two students, uh, Ifai and Yasu. Ifai. Good evening, sir. Please, I have two questions to ask you. The first is on education. So I want to know, because it's unarguable that education is the lifeline of every nation. And we've been ravaged with several strikes, particularly the tertiary arm of uh, the education system. So how do you think, how do you intend to curb this menace of in-season strike, particularly in Nigerian tertiary institutions? And also, how do you intend to boost and take away um, the out of school to take back the out of school children that's primary secondary because they are also the foundation a very important uh, uh, stage of education now my second question although someone from Ibado has uh, briefed on it but that, that will not stop me to still ask you it's about Nigerian unity sir on the issue of Nigerian unity how do you intend to bring together and include every region in your government in terms of appointments, allocations, physical infrastructural development, because some of the separatist agitators have claimed that it is because of the non-inclusion in governance, particularly from the federal level, that is making them to agitate or to separate from the country. Thank you, sir. Okay. Next, we take the question from Yasser. Yasser? Good evening, sir. My name is Mohammed Yasser Gerba from the Department of Mass Communication. Uh, sir, according to the report, Puyo Source BDV is uh, in since the reunion near us this year. So, and the Nigerian government making move uh, to phase out the subsidy. So, sir, are you in support? Uh, if not, what plans do you have in order to address the issue in favor of Nigerians and the Nigerian economy? And the second question, sir, you make a statement that. Uh, you left the board of NDDC because you did not like what was happening there. So, sir, can you shed more light about that? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And I think it's important to remind the um, students and other people who are sending in questions to try not to repeat questions. Because, you know, time is limited. If one person has already asked a question and he has tried to answer it, let's not please go back to it. I will add one question from someone who's just sent it in online, and then you can take them all. This is from um, Sabiu Mustafa. He says, Your Excellency, sir, what would you do to curtail the issue of everyday hyperinflation, which we see in the country? Because low-income earners, especially civil servants, are paying a very high price as a result. So these are your questions. Thank you very much. Now, um, the... Young man from my degree, I thought uh, he should start by acknowledging our effort in the university. You know, when I was governor, we selected uh, four universities, uh, Al-Kalam University, Ahmad Bella University. Um, in fact, uh, uh, my, degree, uh, my degree as Sokoto, Usman Damfodia University, and built 300 bed host, uh, hostel free of charge and donated to that university. And I'm sure it's there as Concursia uh, Hostel mm. in his university. But in any case, uh, just to show how much we care about education, my degree and all the other three universities were not in Kano. But we thought because of our students, that are there, we should donate those hostels. And we did. And uh, let me go to the issue of strike. You see, we checked with ASU on why they were on strike. In fact, why they were going to strike long before now. And I can tell you, most of the time when ASU was on strike in the country, our branch in Kano was taking permission not to go on strike because they believe that all what was necessary for us to do as government, we were doing it. And we are so happy, we are so grateful 
to the uh, Asu branch in Kano, who were working together with us as a family. Well, maybe now, the things have say, changed now. Let, the things that they well, whether they change or not, in the same country, the same idea. I'll tell you so why on, I said it's in, changed. Of the seven things, for example, that Asu are demanding and why they are going on strike, it includes, for example, the fact that they want the federal government to scrape the law that allows for new universities to be built Is and to actually now? focus on funding existing universities. New set of new Is universities. There in our blueprint, yeah. which yes. you said you read. I did. You see, our blue blueprint was very clear mm. that our government will not be in a hurry to build any new yes. university. We were going to concentrate on strengthening our existing universities because we felt it was very critical. No, you, you needed to clarify, us. because earlier you had talked about building new universities. I have read your blueprint. No, people no, no, watching no, no. You can show have me. not. I will somebody, you know I ask somebody I mean? to show you. What we said is very clear. Questions. Yeah. Huh? Maybe accommodation. Yes, Maybe no, that. no, I'm not. I'm saying we're having a conversation that many people have not read your manifesto. That's My job is to bring it out so that That's you can explain. That's why I'm bringing it out now. Yes. That's why I'm saying in our blueprint, we made it clear that our administration would not be in a hurry to establish mm -hmm. new university or any tertiary institution, mm -hmm. but we'll be in a hurry to make sure that all what Asu was saying is in line with also our belief that as at today, we have enough universities and other tertiary institutions. What we don't have is the level of uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, quality in terms of uh, and that size that we are going to improve every sector, every part of our universities, ranging from laboratories to workshops to hostels. Okay. Uh, I think we spent homes. enough time on education because I'm looking at the clock and there are a whole lot of other questions. So should we move to the next one on okay. subsidy? Yes, and out of school children, I mentioned it. Uh, appointment, Nigeria, I mean, the unity of Nigeria. Of course, we have all friends from all over who are qualified to be appointed into our government. Of course, that's the only way you can have peace. And uh, even to you yourself to have peace in mind, you need to go for uh, every part of the country in terms of appointments. Now, oil subsidy. It's a big problem. It's a big issue. And we have seen it. All of us are aware of the level of corruption that is happening in that sector. And that's the first place of all. Stop the corruption. Make sure that every leader... But they that, say a corruption fights back. So how will you stop no, the corruption? No, 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 no. We've fought corruption over the years. You know, if you see corruption fighting back, probably your hands are also not uh, clean. So uh, we have been fighting corruption over the years. And that was why we had all the money we required for uh, projects and programs in all the opportunities that we had. The issue of uh, NDDC, what happened, is exactly this uh, issue of uh, people taking money left, right, and center. But what you I did was, was you didn't stay and fight and clean it up. No, you no, left. No, no, no. What I did was just write a letter and politely tell the president in the letter that so many things were happening, and I went and told him. And of course, uh, at that time, probably he didn't understand, but at the end of the day, uh, he accepted. He said, give me your replacement. I told him that, sir, this place has these issues you want me to. He said, yes, give me a replacement. He insisted, I said, okay, as a president, I have to give you. I give him my party chairman at that time. Okay. I can tell you, few months after, Yes. The whole board has to be dissolved. Okay, because... and talking about NNDC, Bielsa is on standby. Let's hear what they have to say. Hello, Victor. Welcome to Bielsa State. Uh, it's been very interesting listening to Senator Rabi Okokwanso, and we have um, some people that want to ask questions. I'll call on Bielsa first, and Dressman will be on queue. Yeah, good evening, sir. Um, my name is uh, Pelesai Desmond. Uh, my name is uh, Pelesai Desmond. 
and um, I'm an economist. I would like to ask you a very important question. Uh, considering the fact that uh, the Nigeria economy depends on this uh, crude oil, and up to date, our refineries are not actually working. And uh, I find it somehow uh, bad. Actually, I want to ask, I want to know your opinion on this uh, the modular refinery, which is the bunker oil. I want to know if you are in support of it or not, because way back, this our recent uh, flood, I will tell you that, that uh, uh, Baesa actually, we patronize this, this uh, crude oil product. Instead of we patronize this crude oil product and uh, it help us. And I will tell you that this product is actually up to 80 to 90 percent good compared to the normal fuel that we uh, take, we use from the police station. Thank you very much. Okay, the next person is um, Dressman. I would like him to ask his question quickly. Yeah, Dressman Dinepre is my name from uh, the Department of Philosophy, Niger Delta University. Your Excellency, my question is on overflowing. Overflo overflowing has become a recurring decimal in the southern <laughs> states. And uh, if you become the president of this country, what practical steps, knowing that neighboring countries are releasing water from their dams to this country that is causing the overflowing in the country. What will you do to mitigate or solve the problem of flooding in this country if you are elected as the president of this country? Thank you, Your Excellency. Okay, thank you very much, Kaderia. That's it from uh, Thank you, Victor. And let's go straight to the University of Abuja because we have about just 15 minutes. I'd like to get all the remote sites in. And then um, we'll come back to the candidates to round up. University of Abuja, please. If University of Abuja is not ready, I'll come back to the candidate. Abuja is not ready. Let's shout. <laughs> <laughs> I can see them, so I don't understand why we can't hear them. Okay, can you hear me now? Can you hear me now? We can hear you. Go ahead, please. Okay, good evening, Kaderia. Thank you for joining us here at the University of um, Abuja. Um, quite an engaging conversation there. The students actually have a bunch of questions, but because of time, we'll just take two questions. I'm starting with uh, Mansur. Mansur, please go ahead with your questions. Stand up. Good evening. Uh, my name is Mansur Abdullahi from the Department of Microbiology. Um, sir, if by chance you are the president of Nigeria today, my question is how do you intend on resolving Nigeria today? My question is how do you intend on resolving the issue of IPOB in the southeast? And then the second question I have is how do you intend to resolve the issue of Girl child education and early marriage, which is around of animal science. I thought my question goes thus if you have been intended as Nigerian president, how do, how do the candidates intend to curb the minors of unemployment and ensure that students after leaving school are equipped with the right skills to ensure that they are, they are employable and their job for them? Thank you very much. Um, you know, we are on the NTA, the nine o'clock news is sacrosanct, they will not allow us to okay. go beyond that time. So to recap the questions quickly, and if we could have short, short answers, modular refineries and how the people of Bayelsa sort of use them and they're very useful, the issue of over flooding, how to deal with IPOB, early marriage, and how to give people skills to ensure that they're employable. Thank you very much. Now, you see, on the issue of refineries, I remember when I was in the cabinet, we took a decision at that time, after a lot of studies, that these four refineries should be sold to Nigerians, very, very serious and serious uh, Nigerians who would uh, take over 
and of course run them uh, privately so that at the end of the day, government can benefit from taxes and so on. And that is still the at position. At that particular time. But unfortunately, the uh, administration that came in decided not to sell it. And only would you do that? God, God knows how much money this country would have lost in this number of years. Of course, we have to involve our businessmen and women. And we have to keep our eyes everywhere to make sure that whatever we do is not only in the interest of individuals or a group of few people. So we will do whatever it takes. Now we know the uh, Dangote refinery is coming on board. We will do whatever it takes to encourage them uh, so that uh, it becomes a success because its success is not only the success of the businessman Flood. or women who are there, but the success of this country. The issue of overflooding. You see, there are so many problems. It's not only in the south that we have overflooding in this country. In fact, we have a lot of overflooding or flooding when I was governor, and that was why we built so many villages and donated those houses free of charge, meaning we moved out so many villages that were in low-lying areas, especially in Warawa local government, in Makoda local government, in Uchi local government, even my own local so government. So will you do whole-scale movement so, of people? So, you see, first and foremost is that so many people in some cases are building in low-lying areas. Government must look at that. Government must move as many people as possible uh, out. But there are, there are situations where you have a lot of rain and you have a lot of issues in many of our rivers. Don't forget. I am not trying to be rude, sir. But I promise you, if I don't hurry you up, you will not be able to answer all okay. questions. Now, um, I pop. we'll work with nearby or neighboring countries yeah. to make sure that uh, water being released just like that must be checked together. And before I, I, I forget, I have to remind you also that this is my area of specialization. Yes. That's why I had my PhD in all this movement of water and so on. The issue of IPOP, IPOP and all other people who are agitating for one thing or the other, to be clear, even our group. We need to sit down with everybody and discuss. Well, we Will have you release Nam Dikanu if you become president as part of the well, negotiations? Well, we have genuine case. The issue is in the court. I don't think we should start discussing it now uh, in this place. So we'll do whatever it takes to ensure that those who are agitating will come and put it on the table and make sure that uh, the right thing is done. The issue of girl child and early marriages and so on, you see, once you have everybody going to school, most of these issues will resolve themselves. We have seen it in Kano, and at the end of the day, we are able to do a lot to ensure that every child goes to school. Now, finally, the issue of unemployment. Yes, all what we are going to do, I'm sure the young men and women must have heard the issue of one million soldiers, one million police, uh, of course, expanding our universities, uh, providing infrastructure for companies, for I'll give you, I'll give so you on. a minute to round up at the end, but let me quickly ask Bishop one question before we go. Currently, the Nigerian constitution doesn't have provisions for a referendum for people who perhaps decide they do not want to be part of Nigeria. And um, what's the position of the party regarding the people's right to self-determination? Once you are in government, would you be willing to consider um, uh, uh, some sort of constitutional review that allows people to, to go to referendum to decide whether they want to remain with Nigeria or not? Well, you see, uh, the unity of this country is very paramount. But then the wishes of people to be put on table and it depends on what the House of Assembly has to bring about, because it's going to be a lot of main country. And so whatever they come with that suits the generality of the people is what we're on with. Okay. A final question, and after you've answered it, if you can wrap up and talk to Nigerians directly and tell them why they should um, uh, vote for you once more, right? Mm -hmm. 
there are people who think you're a spoiler because you've gone on a rise to say that if you don't win this election or if you think you can't win this election, then you will endorse Asiwa Jubola Ahmed Tinubu. And therefore, they think that uh, the reason you are contesting is to take away votes from your former party, um, the PDP, and to perhaps help Asiwaju win these elections. How do you respond? And when you respond, then you can matter, also wrap up. I thought that matter was being buried. I had an interview, like all others, my colleagues in the game, PDP, APC, uh, Labour, all SDP, they are all our brothers and sisters and so on, and we all know ourselves. I'm not in a business of abusing anybody. But if you make a positive statement on somebody, and people taking it, the young men and women probably on social media, and uh, some people who really don't understand, who, who feel that suits them, will always and go and say it. If I will, uh, you know, say that I will leave it for one of them or any one of them, then why I'm in this game? Look, this NNPP today has more contestants, candidates, than most of these parties, even among the two uh, uh, so-called uh, old parties. So, you see, we are very serious about it. And today, I was reading uh, some papers. Even INEC is preparing for second uh, ballot. Now, why? Because serious people are in the game to the extent that it is even thinking today, unlike what happened from 1999 to date, that there may be second ballot. So if there's a second ballot, ballot and you, you're not on that ballot, let me tell you, will let you me support you, a candidate? Let me tell you clearly. I agree with them today. But give us till January next year. You will see what we can call the real party in this country. We started from the bottom, from zero, and we are building. Now they are putting us among the four. Sometimes they put one picture or the other before our own. Let me tell you, just for the records, take note of it. Wait and see what happens between now and January. You see all the so-called three parties, they are losing grip. It's just, it's just, and there is nothing, absolutely nothing, any of them will do to change this trend coming down. It's only the NNPP whose graph is going up. And you see, our trends is not based on the so-called big, big names and so on. We are going to the grassroots. The way we are playing it is so sophisticated, is so, is such that nobody can go and change the trend now because people have accepted. People are looking for positive change, especially those who know us. Either directly, people are saying Northwest, Northern Nigeria, yes. even the Southern Nigeria now, because our main job now is for Nigerians to know us and know what we say. find themselves. We will consume what we produce and produce what we consume. We will ensure that people patronize made in Nigerian goods. That way we are going to stop capital, capital flights whereby people siphon our resources abroad. We are going to cut the cost of governance. We're going to block leakages. I wish you'd been here a little where, bit earlier oh so you could God. have told me the how. Yes. As it is now, unfortunately, we I have, have the how. Can I we, them? we have run out oh of time. Word. And that's it for the candidates for today. I apologize to people in the room who had a lot of questions to ask, and also the students who joined us from six remote locations because a few of them also wanted to talk a bit more and we had to cut them short. A few people also sent questions via social media that we could not take. I do apologize. Thank you so much, you. Uh, Senator Kwankoso and Bishop Idahosa for joining us on the candidate. Tomorrow, you can join us for our Pondit show, moderated by our very own Nabila Usman. Our commentators will review the three concluded town halls and also the three upcoming ones, starting with the one on Monday, when we'll be in conversation with Mr. Peter Gregory Obi and Dr. Deti Ahmed of the Labour Party. We want to thank the MacArthur Foundation for making this conversation possible. 
and also our partners, NTA, Cabal Entertainment, Silver Bird Television, FRCN, Radio Now, News Central, YouTube, Citizen Zikoko, Emmanuel Chapel, and all of you who joined us for this town hall. Have a wonderful evening.